I'm Byron Williams, you're back with The Small Print, and today my guest is again, Ray Hartley. Ray, uh, for those of you who don't know you, can you please tell us a little bit about who you are and who you work for and what you do? Yeah, I'm the research director at the Brentist Foundation, which is a think tank that looks at trying to create rational economic policy uh, discussions, and we work with uh, African governments and African opposition leaders to just try and build democracy on the continent. Excellent. Well, anyway, the reason we invited you back is because you put out some data not that long ago around polling and expectations for the upcoming South African elections that now have a date towards the end of May. And we want to get your thoughts on that. Your poll numbers seem to indicate as a starting point that you reckon the opposition parties could be perhaps bigger winners than were initially expected a few months ago when things are coming up. I wanted to get your feeling on that, particularly in the in light of what's happened since you put out those polling figures with the likes of Jacob Zuma's MK party and what that could do to disrail both your projections and perhaps the next few months and even few years ahead for South Africa. Yeah, and it was an interesting uh, survey. It showed that the ANC had dropped from 41% in October last year to 39% in February. A uh, small drop of 2%, but quite significant because there's a landmark 40% barrier that's been crossed there. And then I think the opposition has grown, but it's grown in quite a fractured way. So mm -hmm. you have this new entrant called the MK Party, which in our poll got 13%, making it bigger than the EFF, which had 10%. So that's quite a significant political development. Uh, it means that President Zuma is making his way back onto the national political stage. And it means that between them, the MK party and the EFF will have, you know, 20-something percent of the vote. And that then... You know, if you look at, at at the full picture, you've got the ANC with 39% looking for a coalition partner. So they'll have the DA on the one hand with 27%, MK, EFF on the other hand with about 23%. So the question is which way the ruling party will go. I mean, I think that would pretty much set the country's destiny for the foreseeable future. Yeah, well, in terms of both MK and the EFF, they both essentially breakaways from the ANC. Isn't it just a case of getting the good, bad old gang back together, right? I mean, what what are the actual odds? Or why would the ANC not revert to their old alliances and sort of, you know, drink a little bit of humble pie rather than extending a hand across the political aisle, which would basically undo their, their whole positioning in the market? Yeah, you know, I think sometimes, yeah, there's a great Afrikaans word, brother twist. And, uh, you know, sometimes when brothers fall out, it can be worse than when two, uh, you know, other people fall out because the closeness of the bond and then the break is, is so sort of traumatic and severe that uh, it might be harder, actually, for the ANC to get back together with them. I think that's one factor. The other is that the ANC has shed a lot of the RET faction that was mm -hmm. within the party that was more in the sort of Malema, uh, Jacob Zuma type of camp. So Ace Makashula, for example, is no longer there, the sec former Secretary General. He's out and he's gone. Uh, you know, Zwelim Kize is no longer there. Jacob Zuma himself is no longer there. So that, those those people have left the ANC, I think it's one of the reasons you see them dropping down into the 39s and that you see the MK and the EFF uh, going up. So there isn't as much cohesion with the, within the ANC over tilting in the direction of, of MK and EFF as there might have been, say, two years ago when all of those people would have been inside the party. So it's not quite so clear. And it's quite interesting because there's a mirror image on the opposition side. You know, you have you have Musi Maimani and Herman Mashaba, and they're offshoots of the DA. And sometimes that relationship is very difficult for similar reasons, you know. Um, and although uh, lately it's been a lot better, 
because the Action SA and the DA are together in the multi-party coalition. So, yeah, it's not clear. You know, I think that the question of what would happen to Ramaphosa is also quite a major factor because it's unlikely that Malema and Zuma would want Ramaphosa to be the president if they're forming a coalition with the ANC. So that might be the price that they're asking the ANC to pay. And there would then be ambitious people within the ANC like Paul Mashatila and others who would, you know, come forward as potential leadership candidates in that kind of coalition. Okay, and then what about the the blood between the the old goats and the young bucks in terms of the EFF and MK? How how are they getting along? And what are the chances of them forming a viable opposition party that could be bigger than the DA to be our official opposition going forward, even if they aren't necessarily, as you suggest, going to be welcomed with open arms back into the, the comfortable bosom of the ANC? Yeah, no, no, I think that is a strong possibility. I think the EFF would have been quite shocked to see their support dropping the way it has. And they've lost a lot of those people to MK. So the the quick way to stop that is to try and get together with them and not make it a choice um, in the eyes of their supporters. So, there, and there has been some reporting I've read on News24, for example, Adrian Besson has been speculating that the EFF wants to create a coalition with MK already, a pre-election sort of pact of some kind. And it makes complete sense because they stand for exactly the same things. There is a quite a tortuous relationship between Zuma and Malema. You know, they, they fell out and Malema was expelled. And then Malema uh, didn't like Zuma for a long time. And then he started liking Zuma and hating Ramaphosa. You know, so it's kind of, it's it's difficult. It'll be two very uh, tricky personalities to have in one room. But what does that mean for the stability of South Africa to suddenly have a three-body problem instead of an effectively one body, one rather large body problem, which has been our problem in the past? Yeah, I think it's I think it's difficult. It means that there will be a sort of fairly lengthy period of contestation until somebody manages to climb their way to the top. But I think that, you know, it all hinges really on which way the ANC goes. So if the ANC says, right, that's it. We're done with that crowd in the EFF and MK, and we're going now to the center, and we're looking at the IFP, we're looking at Action SA, the DA, et cetera. Um, then I think there is a possibility to sort of for some sort of coalescing at the center to take place. And maybe all of these reforms and stuff that Drummer Paws has been promising on energy and logistics and everything, you know, those partners would be uh much more helpful in getting that stuff done. And I think Ramaphosa knows that this needs to be done quite urgently. But of course, he's had to please people in, in his party who put the brakes on. So that's the one scenario. The other scenario, of course, is Ramaphosa is either hamstrung or he's chucked out and you have a Mashatila presidency in a coalition with uh, MK and the EFF. And I think that we then head in a very populist sort of direction, um, you know, in the, and look out for Venezuela, Zimbabwe type symptoms. Yeah, that that's quite a quite a cheerful take, Venezuelan type symptoms. Okay, so so what are the odds <laughs> here? What are, I know you've done your scenarios in the past, but clearly MK upended all of those scenarios and all those odds that you had. It changes the balance. It's a, which is probably what we needed. We needed some sort of upheaval here, otherwise we were likely to have just a continuation of business as normal when it comes to or business as abnormal as we have in politics in South Africa. Uh, as a as a betting man, or if you were to go onto one of those probability marketplaces, uh, what which way is the ANC going to look? What what are what are your what are your 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 picks in terms of the probability odds? Uh, 50, 50. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Really putting my neck out there. Um, so I think it's very hard to call. I mean, I think that you know, it's if Ramaphosa decides that he. Um, he wants to implement his reform agenda, then I think he's going to drive hard for the center. I think it would be easier for him if the ANC comes in at, say, 45, 
46%, then he can avoid the DA and maybe make a coalition with a whole lot of other smaller parties in the center and push the ANC over the line. However, if they come in at 39 or 40 or 41, he's going to need a big chunk of votes and uh, he would then have to make the choice. So I think that that is the logical place for him to go. If you look at his reform agenda, bringing the private sector in to revitalize the ports and rail and energy and uh, the green transition and all that kind of stuff is all very similar language to what you see coming out of the DA. The DA might not be quite as uh, committed to state control of those enterprises as the ANC is, but it's shades of grey. I think mm. with the UK EFF option, they're going to put a lot, they're going to make a lot of demands, they're going to be very difficult, they're very difficult personalities, they're hard people to negotiate with. Malema's going to probably insist on a deputy presidency, uh, you know, something like that. And then there's, you know, that, that I think is a tougher negotiation. However, <laughs> in the broader deal-making picture, MK has emerged as the biggest pick party in Kwazulu Natal. So MK could save Kwazulu Natal from the DA and IFP by forming a coalition there with the ANC. So they've got something to offer the ANC. They can offer them a province as well as national government. You know, there's a there's a trade-off there that they can do, which I don't think the other parties are nearly in the same position. Um, perhaps the DA could do the same in Kharteng. Um So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, there's just too many variables here to kind of make a clear call. I think if logic and rational uh, choices were made that relate to policy, it would have to be a move to the center. But if populist, and there's a lot of populism in the NC, if you look at their foreign policy and a lot of other aspects, there is a strong populist bent there that rules the day, then they'll go the other way. Okay. So talk to <laughs> me about the the other opposition alliance, the DA and friends, or, or lack thereof. I mean, they've been making friends and enemies left, right, and center. Uh, talk to me about their future when they might not be the official opposition anymore, as you said, if there's like an MK EFF alliance, even if they're not aligned with the ANC. The DA's position as party number two, even as a very small number two compared to the very big number one, uh, could could be in jeopardy. How, how how are things feeling down there? What what are what are the prospects from the DA and why, from my perspective, as someone that uh, tries to look at it from the outside looking in and doesn't quite make quite, can't quite understand why the DA has chosen perhaps some of the some of the players and some of the some of the fights that it has, you know, like why the, the particular hills it's chosen chosen to stand on seem rather petty and perhaps less um, important given the huge stakes of the, the game at hand. Yeah, look, I mean, I think the DA will still marginally, according to the latest data, be the, the second biggest party. But it's, you know, is MK surging and growing bigger? Is, but what, is but not if question. not if, if if there was a more formal alliance, as is hinted, between like the EFF and MK, right? I mean, well, so there would be at twenty three, and the DA is at twenty seven. So the gaps close. Close. close uh, yes. I think that you know it, it all depends really on what happens with this MPC coalition. So that's the DA and the IFP and Action SA, um, and and others. If they cohere into a more united uh, political force going forward, which they might do if there's this rise on the left, then they would still be fairly substantially the second biggest party. So together at the moment, they're all on 33%. Mm. Um, so, you know, that could be a dynamic that develops into the future is that, you know, if it's if, if it's hard to distinguish some of the ANC and DA's policies on, say, you know, state-owned enterprises and public-private partnerships and so on, it's much harder, really, to distinguish the DA from Action SA, from Musi Maimani, from um, the IFP when it comes to policy. They're very close. So there might be some panic in the ranks there and a pull together 
to try and create a larger uh, centrist opposition. Then my question is, is John Stanhees in the man to rally that? I mean, you're talking about larger than life figures in the in the in the op- in the opposing opposing party uh, yeah. positions, right? Like, yeah, is, he's is actually. <laughs> he's, I think he's actually said that he's not that key to be the leader of that uh, MPC uh, and would be happy to run their parliamentary business, which I think is his first, you know, kind of calling. I mean, that's why yeah. how he made his name as a, a sort of firebrand in on the benches. Um, and the MPC has not chosen a leader, and that would only come in the event that they're in some sort of victorious coalition. Um, but... If they were to get together, I don't. I, uh, I'm not sure that he would insist on taking that position. Um, but who else is there? What are the other? What are the other actual leadership options? And I think this is this is the crux of the South African policy and politics problem, right? Like, uh, where are the the good leaders? Right, the the strong names that people can look up to and get excited about voting for. Or are they only on the, the populist, so far left is right side of the spectrum? Yeah, I think that's the problem, is that you're competing with populists, and it's <laughs> quite hard to do that. So somebody like V.F. Labisa, the leader of the IFP, he's quite a he's quite an engaging person. He's, a, he's got a very strong style, and he's very calm. He's taking the IFP out of that sort of Butelezi era into a more modern kind of urban movement and he's trying to spread it nationally he's got problems you know he's got mk taking votes in quasi natal and so on um but he's certainly somebody who could step forward at some stage i would say and then you know whether some other people like musi maimane and the songhezo zibis and so on if they finally accept that maybe they're not really doing that well on their own you know they could come into the picture in, in some sort of future arrangement as well Okay, that seems that seems like it could be there could be some more interesting dynamic tension. But there's it's not it's not room to panic right yet. That there are some reasons perhaps to to be excited at least about at least we've got some we've got we've got an actual race now, right? I think yeah. that's that's what that's that's what's exciting, and that's yeah, what's that's one of the more exciting elections that we've had for a while. And there's an actual race. There's there's sort of an unknown entity here. There's a reason to actually participate at the polls. And, and in your perspective, do you think South Africans are feeling that way? Or do you think also looking at your polling data, uh, that's that uh, oh. there there is still more apathy? What are, what are your what are your thoughts around uh voter turnouts essentially in Maine? Yeah, it's quite interesting. I think the IEC registered more young people than it has for a very long time. And that indicates there may be a surge of voting there. I also think the rise of MK and the fact that it's it got so big so quickly is probably going to scare a lot of voters who may have been complacent or apathetic ANC camp type of voters, and certainly in the opposition, mm. you know, the DA, et cetera. It might mobilize people into actually going out there and and voting because now there's a real sort of reason to vote threat, in inverted commas out there. You know the the return of the of of state capture. You know is something that you could mobilize uh, against, and people people really know that and remember it, and and are very very against it in that ANC and opposition. You know in the, in the sort of Ramaphosa faction in the ANC. So it could be it could have a mobilizing effect. And on the other hand, this momentum with MK and momentum's a lot in politics. And um we it's not clear if they've hit the ceiling or if they're gonna go further. Yeah, I mean you won't you won't know until until after the day, but there, there does seem to be a sense that individuals can feel like their votes their votes might have more of an impact whereas in bygone elections there was this kind yeah. of sense oh, ANC is going to win anyway what's the difference you know whether I've whether I actively or passively sort of endorse that prospect right so you can yeah. sort of 
we kind of know what the pattern is, what's the difference between a between a you know 30% and a 32% for the DA in Johannesburg or whatever the case may be. It wasn't uh there didn't seem to be that sense of urgency, but there kind of is now. And there's urgency for all sorts of reasons. Obviously, like the, the economic situation, electricity situation, and all these other things sort of compounding, but definitely an urgency in terms of who actually gets to to, to own this pie going forward. My other question for you, because you do look in the policy space, obviously, and you're looking not just at South Africa, but also at the way the world is looking at South Africa. What insights do you have around the sorts of horses that the various international powers that be might be interested in backing, given the kind of landscape that we've laid out today? Uh, Washington, who, who would Washington like to see win? I mean, the ANC hasn't exactly delighted, you know, the Biden administration with some of its more questionable political uh, geopolitical bargaining chips over the last few months. But what is what is which horse would America be backing in a in a proverbial, perhaps fantasy world where international powers occasionally do meddle in elections? What directions might they be meddling in? And then when it comes to the BRICS side of the equation, where are they looking at? And what about the Middle East? What what would the Middle East like to see in South Africa? Because I know we are in the bottom of the world here in South Africa, but we are still largely a gateway to a lot of the still as yet unpillaged resources of Africa. And as such, we do garner more than perhaps the attention we deserve in terms of international eyes on our political table. If not in the media, no one really cares. No one thinks about us as a, as a country and our benefits and our how uh, how well we're doing as individuals and as a society. But for political reasons, there are reasons to perhaps want certain parties in charge in South Africa. Do you have any views there? Or is that just too controversial for you to wade into? No, I think it's I think it's absolutely fascinating. I think there is huge geopolitical competition taking place. And I think Southern Africa is definitely in the cauldron of that competition. And if you look at SADC, you know, if you look at DRC and Zambia and renewables and renewable energy minerals that are there at copper and so on, these are things that are highly prized by all of these players. Um, you know, it's fascinating at the moment, the Americans are building a rail link through from Luanda on that coast through to the DRC, through Zambia, uh, to, you know, trains that just happen to be carrying rene renewable min minerals. And China's doing the same thing on the other side, coming in through Tanzania and up through uh, Zambia. So, you know, there is that massive competition. I think well, I think the Biden administration has actually been very restrained in it's its like criticism it. of South Africa. It hasn't actually come out and uh, walloped South Africa. It said it disagrees with the case that has been brought but it hasn't really, you know, and I think South Africa has worked really hard to try and save the day there because, mm. uh, you know, Pandor has been in the States, you know, trying to sort of correct the impression, as it were, that we're, you know, proxies of, of the Russians and the Chinese. So it's not that clear cut. I do think, however, that when it comes to the party and their interests, um, they're very much tied to the BRICS bloc and in particular to Russia and China. And so you have this, you know, I think what, what's happening is plastering over the cracks with the Americans, but the, you know, it's the heart, the heart is in the other camp. And I think at some point that is going to lead to problems. So mm -hmm. you've got others uh, you know, firstly, there may be a change of administration in, in the United States. That would not be good. The uh, parallels uh, are there. <laughs> <laughs> we could find ourselves with a totally new foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, You know, you could find yourself with a, a a Trump kind of decision to just like go for South Africa or something uh, crazy like that. So, you know, it's, it's up in the air. I mean... I think the the Russians, the Chinese want the ANC to stay in power here. They wouldn't. They would like the ANC to form an alliance with MK and and Malema. That would be very much their choice in this in this debate. Yeah, and the rest of the world is uh, will will leave us to to eat our own cooking, I suppose, <laughs> and then deal you know, with the. Yeah, you know, Europe Europe's extremely distracted by Ukraine. I don't think they really want to. Think about getting involved in some Southern African. No, they don't think about us at all. <laughs> yeah, 
Um, so, yeah, I, I think Africa particularly, you know, needs, Southern Africa needs South Africa to be functional. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, and they may all be liberation movement partners and share that ideology and so on, but they need a functioning dynamic economy in South Africa. Otherwise, everybody goes down the tubes. Yeah, money talks, right? That's the that's the bottom line. So follow the incentives all the way down, and you'll perhaps get a slightly clearer picture of the of the future ahead. But um, thank you very much, Ray, for articulating the the new race and the new characters on the table, and perhaps the, some of the the new dynamics that we have to at least give us a kind of reason to to vote for or fight for, hopefully less less uh, literally the the future going forward. Thank you. Thanks so much. And if people want to find you to continue the conversation, engage your services, give you money, whatever the case might be, uh, where can they find you, Ray? Uh, uh, just the website, I think. The branchesfoundation.org. Thank you very much. That's right. I'm wearing red. I did that very deliberately to try and capture your attention instead of my usual black. I did that because I've got quite important and very exciting, for me at least, announcement. And that is that our new book, Rescuing Our Republic, which has been written in conjunction with my friends and colleagues at Discourse ZA, is now out and about in bookstores across South Africa and available online for anyone else that is curious about South Africa. And as I've said before, as a futurist and a trained analyst and economist, I do think that South Africa is one of the clearest bellwethers as to where the weird Western world is headed. And as such, there's something you can learn from us at the bottom of Africa. We are ahead of quite a few of the trends that you're just wrapping your heads around. Anyway, this book is based on some of our most popular and most revealing, interesting and important conversations that we've had over the last couple of years at Discourse ZA, which is a YouTube channel you should absolutely subscribe to. It's also available as a podcast if you're interested in anything to do with politics, philosophy and economics. But the conversations in this particular book are focused on, as the title says, rescuing our republic, or more specifically, what civil society and individuals should be thinking about and doing and starting if they are interested in investing in a future for South Africa that we actually want to be a part of. Anyway, I would love for you to read this book and to give it to someone either that you like or that you hate, because the purpose of this book is to kickstart conversations, conversations around big, interesting, ugly even, but important ideas that are worthy of debate. So if you're planning on being bored or understimulated at a family or friend event this festive season, this is the book you need to give you the conversation starters to start a debate or a fight with those who you love or love to hate most.